So today we're going to be working on a Western Digital 4 terabyte hard drive that was removed out of this Western Digital My Book. Uh, you've probably seen these commonly in uh, online retailers or maybe in your local store. Uh, they're very common today. You plug this into your laptop or computer and you're able to access the hard drive that's inside of it. So this is the actual hard drive that was inside of this Western Digital My Book. A lot of people don't realize, but essentially this black casing that you purchase is just a normal three and a half inch uh, internal hard drive that's connected to one of these uh, external housings or casings that you then connect uh, with a with some form of power supply and typically a SATA or USB cable uh, to your computer. In this particular case, the customer did let us know that the hard drive was not powering on. So after a storm had occurred, uh, the customer stated that the next morning he went to turn on his computer to access all of his business files and the hard drive was not connecting to the computer. Uh, and in which case he went and noticed that there are, the, the lights seemed to be different on the WD MyBook. At XI Repair, we know that from doing thousands of these exact data recoveries, that in most cases, any power related issue is going to be with a fault with the printed circuit board. So first what I'm going to do is I've already taken out this hard drive from its casing so that we can test the drive ourselves. And the customer's concern was correct. The drive itself did not power up. So we're going to look at this printed circuit board. So in almost all cases, it's going to be an issue with the printed circuit board. So we need to first diagnose that issue by removing it. All of the important components that control the power are on the other side of this printed circuit board. And so we really can't do any proper diagnostics without removing it. These four screws will be removed. And it looks like we have a stripped one. I'm not sure if the customer has attempted to do this uh, himself or not, but I'm going to switch the view around so that we can actually, you guys can actually see for yourself this stripped screw. So you can see right there, this screw is definitely not in good shape. Uh, I'm going to put one of the other screws back in so you can compare what it would look like if the screw was in good shape. So you can see here a little bit of a shadow, uh, but it's a perfect um, six point star, which is the type of connector uh, that we're using here. It's called a Torx screw. Uh, but over here, uh, the star as well, not much of a star anymore. So I've used the safest method possible so far to try to remove this screw. And for the life of me, it will not come out. Um, I am not exactly sure why this screw is being so stubborn, but it is. So we're going to resort to some extreme measures. Now we have this very small Dremel. I apologize the noise for the noise in advance, but we're going to do some surgery here. Now essentially what we're going to do is actually cut off, see if we can cut into this screw. So here we go. Need a little more taken off.
All right, there we go. So now we got it. So as you can see, I'm able now to twist this screw out safely without damaging anything. It does take a lot of pressure on my hand, but now we've got this screw out safely. All right, so that screw is definitely no good. Now, if you notice, there's no damage. So that's a good thing. So I'm gonna clean this up a little bit. Just get those little pieces of metal. There we go. And you literally cannot even tell that we did anything to this. Um, when you do this enough, you can get good like that to where you don't have to worry about damaging the PCB. All right, so we're gonna set this hard drive to the side because it's no good if we can't get it powered on. And now we're going to do a visual inspection of this PCB. So we're just going to look around and see if we see anything that jumps out at us. We're looking for any components that maybe look like maybe they got too hot or have become detached. So nothing major yet. to do is test these diodes. This is what most commonly goes out uh, in my experience. So we're going to put this in diode mode. We're going to test each one of these diodes. So I'm getting good readings on all of these diodes. Um, this is the power connector uh, right here. So this is the area that we're really concerned about on the board. Um, it's possible for it to be shorted elsewhere, but nine times out of 10, it's going to be one of these resistors or the diodes. So next thing we're gonna do is to test these zero ohm resistors. So it's good, good. good. Now this is what I was afraid of with this one. Um, no obvious uh, signs of damage. Uh, we could go a lot further on this board, but it would be much more practical to use what's called a donor drive. Uh, so this is a donor drive here. Uh, you can see I've already got it labeled here. This is one that I know is working well. So what we're going to do here is we have our original PCB that's not working. Uh, and we're, we have a donor PCB that is a very, very uh, close match in order for us to do this successfully. Uh, there is this very small chip. Uh, it's called a U12 uh, ROM chip. Essentially, this controller uh, has to be functioning in order for the drive to, um, in order for the drive to get the data. Uh, if this controller trip is wrong, for example, if I took the one from the donor board and put it over here, uh, even if this PCB was functioning, the data would not populate. Uh, 
uh, and you would not be able to remove the data uh, from this hard drive. So first thing we're going to do um, is label them if you haven't already, in my case I already have. Uh, so I am going to come down here and I am going to remove this chip. Now we notice that this little dot corresponds with this dot on the PCB itself. So that's how we'll remember the orientation uh, which it, uh, for which the controller chip should be placed when we return it. Now to make this process simple, uh, I like to add a little bit of solder. It's going to make removing the chip safer. So essentially we just want to add some solder to each one of the legs. And I'm really not worried about bridges right now. Even though I need my tip to heat up more because we're just removing it. And you can see how much more solder is put on from us doing this. So this is going to allow us to remove this with a lot less force. So next, we want to carefully heat up this component. Uh, where we place heat is important because we want to preserve this donor board because uh, we need this board functioning once we put on the controller, the customer's original controller chip. I.e. we also want to stay away from melting any of the plastic. Just like that, we can pull away. We're going to set that controller IC to the side, as well as this PCB. And now what we're going to do is actually, um, first I'm going to clean up, before I'm going to do this, I'm going to go ahead and clean up these pads. You can see this one right here is still bridged. There we go. That way, when I immediately when I remove the controller chip from the customer's original board, we can easily just swap it without me having to set it down. It's going to make the process simpler. So as just noted before, it's the same orientation. And it's really important if you do attempt to do this yourself, which I would not recommend if you're not a professional, uh, you do have to make sure that the PCBs match uh, and there's a lot of information you need to know about in order to match them. There are certain numbers on the back uh, such as uh, the PCB board number, um, there's different um, rev numbers, it'll say REV AA or REV AB. Uh, a lot of times these numbers need to be very close if not matching entirely uh, for this process to work. Just like that, I removed my original controller chip, and I'm going to bring this back and put this in place. So we're going to heat this up, and then we're going to slowly set this in. We have to be very careful not to damage any other components. It's a little more flex. There we go. And we notice how that time it just went right into place. Now one thing we can do to really just make sure it has a good solid connection is go back and touch it up. 
Uh, this would work, and as you could tell, it looks just like it did from the factory. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with making each one of these connections a little bit stronger. And as we notated earlier, the dot, as you can see on that far right, top right corner, matches with the dot on the board. All right, so now we're going to just clean this up a little bit. It doesn't have to be perfect because we need to really just test this. So what we're going to do now is reconnect this new donor board with the customer's original hard drive. So clean this flux off my working area. This is the customer's original drive. I'm going to flip this over. And we're going to screw in. customer's new donor PCB. And because that one screw was stripped, obviously we can't return that. So I'm just going to be putting in three. Um, they just have to, the PCB just has to make a connection uh, here on the uh, uh, back side of the hard drive. So this should work fine. All right, so now what we're going to be doing uh, is we're actually going to be taking the hard drive, um, which is here, uh, that we just repaired, and we're going to be connecting it to this machine here. It's a very fancy data recovery machine. So we're going to be taking the hard drive that we just put the new PC donor PCB on, and we're going to be connecting it to this uh, fancy rig. Um, this is a deep spar imaging system, and this allows us to do a lot of uh, data recovery operations on these drives. It's very helpful in these types of situations. This particular machine does not actually have a power button, so um, I use a metal stick like this to short the power pins, the power connector pins, and it will turn on like that. Voila! Uh, you can see the fans spinning. This one will start spinning in just a second. And now the software will pop up on this monitor. All right, so now that our deep spar dim imaging system is up, we're going to type in this command prompt. Uh, a lot of the commands for the software is through command prompt. All right, so we have a destination drive plugged in behind this machine. Uh, and we're going to press F11 to actually power on this drive. And we're gonna see if we get power. So. It's actually spinning now. Look at that, we have power. So perfect. So this is exactly what we're looking for. You can see now we have the source drive um, and this drive is actually physically spinning. All right, so now that we know for sure that the customer's drive is working, which is a really good sign, uh, we're going to actually start imaging it. So this particular tool is, is uh, was developed by some very smart computer engineers. And what it does is it allows us to image this drive regardless of the condition of the data. So a lot of times if you have a hard drive that's corrupt or has other issues uh, it, and you plug it into a Windows machine, it'll just sit there and chug and chug and chug and chug. You've probably noticed this yourself, especially if you're watching this video. Uh, and this tool allows us to bypass a lot of those issues and errors that you might come into. It allows us to directly image the drive. So as we can see here, the DeepSpar Imaging Data Recovery System is imaging the device block by block, sector by sector, and so far we haven't had any bad blocks. Uh, as you can see in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, right here, this is the time that it's going to take for this system to run. Um, now a lot of times, especially when these drives are not into good, uh, good condition, um, and if they've already had issues, most of the time they're not in great condition. Uh, the, the, pro the time that it can take to image is going to be a lot slower. 
Uh, another thing that we may see is the higher capacity drives are obviously going to take longer, and this is a four terabyte drive. Uh, but so far, yeah, you can already see here that we have 66 documents, 816 photos, uh, 31 different types of media. Um, this information is very valuable, and we have barely gone through uh, even 1% of the drive. So, so far, we've already got a good bit of the customer's data back. Uh, and by the end of this 13 hours, uh, we should have almost all of the customer's data back. So stay tuned. All right, so now that the device has the drive has successfully imaged to our uh, known working hard drive. We're actually going to connect this hard drive to an external reader. All right, now that we've got our drive connected to our external reader, we're going to come into our studio. Now, obviously we do not want to format the, the drive. Now, this particular drive, we can see here the deep spar image uh, automatically populated. Uh, and this is essentially a clone of that WD My Book. All right, this is just a clone of it. Now that we got it working, we wanted to transfer it to a known working hard drive, and now we want to analyze that data. So in some cases, if this does not automatically populate, if you are using a program like RStudio, you may have to you may have to assign a disk drive letter, uh, which you can do by looking up drive management and you can see here that it will give you an option to right click on these drives and click change drive letter. Now, sometimes you'll have to add one for it to automatically populate on your computer. It just kind of depends on how the settings are set up. So we can see here that the customer's partition uh, did successfully image. So what we're going to do is do a scan. So we want to scan, we're going to do detailed, we're going to click scan. Now this is going to take quite some time. Um, this are, these are different sectors in here, and we can see as it goes one by one, just like on the DeepSpar Imager, it's going to go block by block by block, analyzing every portion of the data. Uh, this is a very, very, very powerful data recovery tool that also connects directly with that DeepSpar Imager. So this is going to help us make sure that we get all of the customer's data back and possibly even things that were deleted. So we're going on a little bit over an hour of this recovering all of the customer's data. Uh, as you can tell, we're a little bit over halfway through um, and we'll be back shortly to finish it up. This was just a very large drive, almost four terabytes of data uh, that is being recovered. So it's taken quite some time. So now that all the data has been recovered, we can open up the file explorer and we can see here all of the customer's data that's been recovered. So we successfully recovered a total of 225 gigabytes worth of data, uh, 68,000 files and 2,400 folders. So this customer should be very happy with the results of getting all of their data recovered.